and, and welcome for coming um, to this session. Um, obviously, MRS always being a little bit of a of an outcast technique. So I hope I'll be able to convince you that it's still an interesting thing to do. Um, first of all, um, my name is Georg Olchner. I'm at Johns um, Hopkins University, and I have no conflict of interest to declare at all. Nobody gives me corporate money to do what I do, unfortunately, or for the best of it. So um, my, my assigned talk title was really Opportunities and Challenges of MRS Research. And um, I guess in the context of reproducibility. Um, and so for this talk, I wanna first spend a good amount of time um, describing the challenges that the MRS field um, faces in particular with regard to the um, variability, but also the validity of quantitative results that, that we get from, from doing um, what we do. Um, I'll briefly outline some current developments that are going on to improve both. And then in the second half of this, um, I will provide some live um, hands-on software demonstration of software that we use and develop in, in our lab to provide more reproducible MRS research. Um, obviously, I'd obviously um, love to spend a lot more time on the entire um, arena of reproducibility in MRS because it spans acquisition, it spans data processing, modeling, quantification. Um, there's only so much time today, so I'll um, just hope to provide like a brief snapshot of everything. And I also hope that it just doesn't feel too crammed overall. So there are some chances that um, you have not heard of MRS before, and particularly if you're watching this um, on your screen uh, later on as a recording. In that case, I want to just give you a super quick primer on what MRS is all about, um, just about two or three minutes. So obviously, when we do proton MR imaging, um, the vast majority of the signal that we receive is water, um, mostly because the body is obviously mostly water and water has two protons. But there are, as you may be aware, also other molecules that have protons, and they are really what MRS is all about. And um, the secret source is that depending on the chemical environment that these protons are in, they will process at slightly different frequencies. So when we record a spectrum, it looks very much like here. We plot the intensity of the signal that we receive in our coil um, over its frequency. So these um, x-axes that you would see in, in a lot of our spectral plots, these re um, represent frequencies. And we know fairly well, in theory, um, which peaks represent which compound. So we get characteristic spectral signatures for different molecules, and um, different molecules are involved in multiple um, physiological processes, obviously. So very, very basically in MRS, what you do um, is you measure a localized signal, so either in single voxel fashion from a, a, um, from a single region or with um, spectroscopic imaging. There are many, 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 many different ways of doing this. They're all optimized for slightly different purposes and applications. So it's enormously heterogeneous. What all of these techniques, uh, techniques have in common is that by the end, you have one or more spectra. Um, and these are generated from the raw data by a series of, of quite complex pre-processing operations. These spectra are then um, in a analysis and modeling um, step decomposed into individual components from metabolites that contribute to the signal. Most commonly, this is the linear combination modeling, which you see um, exemplified in this plot here. Um, you approximate the spectrum as a weighted sum of simulated spectral signatures. Um, and during quantification, you attempt to convert the modeling parameters into meaningful um, units of concentration. And you're making all kinds of assumptions about relaxation behavior, for example, there. Um, and it's probably not hard for you to, to grasp that already in from this brief description, there are so many ways in which you can arrive at different quantitative estimates for your metabolite concentrations, because at every step of the way, um, there are different ways of doing it. So everyone here at this workshop, I think, is, is aware that, that, we acquire, that the way that we acquire and analyze our data um, matters and has drastic influence on the outcome and the conclusions. And MRS is no exception. And in many ways, as well, I will hope to show you, it's even more susceptible to, uh, susceptible to it. Um, this is this famous Nature paper um, on fMRI data analysis. Um, and a lot of these uh, things that were observed in this paper can really be, be ported one, one by one over to, to, um, to MRS, like a, a massive flexibility of analytical approaches. 
If you ask 20 spectroscopists to share their analysis workflows with you, you will get 40 or 50 different scripts probably. Um, there is sizable variation in the results. I will spend some time on that. Um, it is obviously important to validate your methods. Validation can be really hard, like in MRS, where you don't really have a ground truth. Um, you obviously can do in animals, but the conclusions will still be a bit difficult. I'll talk a little bit about how synthetic data sets might help us with that. And finally, the aspect that ties all of it together, and I think we've heard quite a lot in, in, in this session about this, how does collaborative work, data and workflow sharing help us improve our confidence in the science that we do? The MRS world is a small world, it's a small field, and these practices have taken quite some time to pick up some steam, but it is happening um, as we speak. And I will point you towards a couple of resources that we have been working on um, to change towards a more reproducible um, research practice. So let's start with the, the positive. There is awareness in the field that we have a problem of heterogeneity and reproducibility. There was an entire special issue of NMR in biomedicine edited um, by Roland Kreis just um, over the last couple of months. And it's a massive collection of, of consensus efforts on practically everything touching um, MRS. And that to me is just such a striking indication that the field has been methodologically so enormously diverse in the past that it has become problematic. Um, because so many MRS researchers um, have performed experiments and analyses always in their own way, but typically these methods stay within the lab and they never see the light of day really, um, which um, we've heard on um, a lot in, in other contexts of other um, imaging modalities before. It's particularly highlighted um, um, in the context of reporting standards, which is kind of, as we heard earlier today, kind of the minimum, the, the, really the, the, the least we can do is accurately report the stuff that we do. But even this has always um, been a problem in, in the sense that not always were MRS methods completely reported all in terms of acquisition and post-processing and that analysis. So because we are so limited in time, I'll try and focus on the processing and modeling side and pretty much um, skip over the acquisition side. Um, as we just read, consensus recognizes that there is um, an enormity of ways to process and model data. So just for um, doing this crucial bit of fitting your spectrum and um, the linear combination modeling, you can choose between so many different algorithms and softwares, it makes your head spin. Um, the most prominent of which is probably the LC model software, which used to be a commercial um, black box closed source algorithm costing $13,300, I think, the developer retired last year. The code is now available, but we still have a situation where the kind of de facto gold standard of an entire field is discontinued and not developed anymore. Um, so fortunately, over the last couple of years, and um, the, the, the um, bolt printed software, the Osprey software is a package that I've been actively developing. We've seen several new modular toolboxes released, and they're all quite similar in conception and design. Um, they all try and pull the process um, of, of modeling the spectra more into the light. It's kind of the core premise um, of all of these to have transparency and reproduci uh, reproducibility. And I will highlight a little bit about this in the second part of the live demo. But just to show you, you can, you can pick pretty much any software you like to, to carry out this modeling process. Now, that wouldn't be such a problem if all these softwares um, gave you similar or comparable numbers in the end, um, which, as you will guess, um, otherwise I wouldn't have this grand introduction, is not necessarily the case. So in my group at Hopkins, we're in, in increasingly interested in investigating how much of a difference it makes, what kind of analysis you're using. So um, we've looked at a large number of in vivo human three Tesla short echo time um, spectra, which is kind of like the workhorse really of clinical um, spectroscopy. There's a large multi-site collaboration that um, our group at Hopkins, under the, lead, um, the leadership of my, my um, postdoc mentor, Richard Eden, um, has compiled more than 250 of these data sets, which is currently the largest um, raw data set of, of spectra in the world, I believe. Um, these spectra are very rich in information with lots of overlap between signals. So any of these modeling algorithms have a lot to unpack. And so we analyze these spectra with um, our own software, Osprey, but also with the LC model software and the Tarquin software, which are arguably the two, mostly widely, um, two most widely used tools on the market today. But what we see is that even for the stronger signals in the spectrum, the really prominent ones, 
NAA and choline and myoinositol and glutamate and glutamine, there are substantial differences between the tools. And that not just concerns, as you can see here, um, the mean estimates, but also the mutual agreements of the cross tool correlations turn out to be relatively poor. So you'd want all of these correlation plots to be on a line along the main diagonal, but instead you have large clouds. So it's not just a systematic bias for each tool, but actual disagreement. And that just means that really the choice of um, modeling tool itself introduces substantial uh, variance into your um, results. We did variance partition analysis as well, and we found that for um, myoinositol and glutamate and glutamine, the choice of tool can account for um, half or even more of the total observed variance. So um, it's quite, it's quite um, sobering to, to see these numbers in real life, and we and others are beginning to investigate more systematically where these differences really come from. But it's pretty clear there's already um, room for improvement. Um, one put potential solution to at least do some harmonization in, in vendor and site differences is to borrow um, the quite popular combat algorithm, which is a Bayesian approach to, to um, mitigate variability effects in gene expression originally. And this has previously been applied to fMRI data and um, Ashley Harris and Tiffany Bell in Calgary have applied this to the same large data set that, um, that um, our own analyses are based on. And they were at least able to um, reduce a couple of um, site and vendor differences and partition this variance out so this, this is a quite promising way to, to alleviate some of the problems that we see. What's really um, problematic with just looking at a large number of in vivo data sets is obviously that you have no ground truth, right? So you rely on your modeling algorithm to pull out the right numbers for you out of the spectrum. Um, what we can fortunately do pretty well um, is doing simulations of what our metabolite signals will look like and we can then create synthetic spectra that we drag through our fitting and modeling algorithms, um, which interestingly, despite the fact that we can do that, hasn't really been done a lot until quite recently. So the MRS study group organized a fitting challenge with artificial data, um, which varied kind of the relative contributions from the metabolites and they varied the spectral quality. And the challenge was pretty much go make a pipeline fit these data sets with a software of your choice and just see how close you get to the, the original concentration values that we use to generate these data. And so 26 teams participated. They used a whole bunch of different packages and settings. And well, so what you see on the left-hand side is pretty much all of the fits to the data. They look visually really good, which is kind of, yeah, the, the, one of the criteria that, that in MRS is, is what you have is um, to, to judge whether what you're doing makes, makes sense. The model residuals were basically noise, um, but quantitatively, all of these solutions didn't agree with each other. So they didn't agree with the ground truth. What you see on the right-hand side, the percentage difference between measured concentrations and ground truth um, for the different submissions even the most widely used package, so the LC model software here, will easily bring in 10 or 20% of bias, even for the strongest signal, um, the NAA signal, um, which is this largest peak in the spectra that you can see. And similarly, between five and 15 for glutamate, which is also quite strong and prominent metabolite. So they also didn't agree well with each other because obviously these differences were very different across the board between software solutions, but also, within tool, just with different settings. So um, it really depends on what you do and how you do it, which is in some ways um, very concerning. In other ways, we're at least starting to appreciate the fact that this variability exists in the first place. So um, this is what, I, what I'm trying to propose or to, to encourage the field to do is to discover and quantify how variability emerges, where it comes from, how is it introduced by the choice of our analysis pathway? Um, this is something that we can't necessarily do with these typical N equals 15 methods paper. So we need to get a bird's eye view really to, to see the effects that, we, that emerge. And what should be really helpful there is to embrace the power of artificial and synthetic data, um, which should really help us um, gain a better understanding of the validity, at least of our modeling results in the absence of, of being able to, to um, you know, actually compare to a, a gold standard. 
which is technically possible by sacrificing animals and then measuring the concentrations of metabolites with other means. Um, but this is this is one aspect that I that I want to highlight is just key how we how a a a a key analysis step that we all rely on and that we've always come kind of like taken for granted um, introduces such a massive degree of variability. So before I move to the live demo, I quickly want to um, circle back to what we're doing at a community level to make MRS um, more, not just reproducible, but also accessible, I guess, and inclusive. Um, myself and others, we founded um, an official committee for MRS code and data sharing, which is now um, a standing permanent committee of the study group. And these are our current members, three members rotate off each year, three new ones um, rotate on. And our mission is really to, to um, cre create community organized resources that will help the field address its short, uh, shortcomings. And that not just uh, covers analysis te techniques, but also the gathering, what we're doing right now, for example, an open source library of educational material aimed at newcomers, which is kind of a, um, a cohort that MRS traditionally hasn't been overwhelmingly friendly to. We have created a centralized online resource, um, the MRS Hub, which is an actively um, curated open source software and code collection. We have a forum um, as a community space to discuss and collaborate, and we have a collection of data sets that other people can hopefully benefit from. Um, speaking of which, data sharing in MRS, I promised we'd briefly touch upon that. It's unfortunately um, a relatively short history because the track record of MRS in data sharing is not that great. There's not a lot of publicly available data sets, despite the fact that 20 years ago, there have been big studies like the Interpret um, project collecting in vivo data, ex vivo data on tumors. Project ran out of funding. Future of the database is currently unclear. And uh, it's currently a, really not known whether this data set will be available in the future, which is a little bit sad because technically it's to date still the largest um, MRS database to ever exist. So attitudes do seem to change a bit lately. So as I say, the, the big GABA study was this big 250 um, subject acquisition led by, by my mentor, Richard Eden, um, across 25 sites and three vendors. So that has um, fortunately um, sparked a lot of follow-up work, not just by ourselves. We've plunged our, our analysis teeth into it, but so have others as well. We currently use Nitric to use our data. Others rely on, on other large scale existing neuroimaging infrastructure, um, like this data set here um, from, uh, I believe, out of Oxford. Um, I believe also in the 200s um, of, of sample size. Others are using Zenodo or SF. At the MRS Hub, um, we try and collect all these publicly available data sets in a central listing. We provide an option to host small amounts of data ourselves. Um, although our primary focus is certainly on collecting the software. Currently, Alex Lynn in Boston is developing a spectroscopy, uh, spectroscopy specific online database called the MRSDB, um, supposed to contain reference data from healthy volunteers as well as from um, various disorders. The idea um, there is to have an integrated analysis pipeline in the cloud. What will help with that is an additional effort that is currently underway, which is a bids extension for MRS to make storage and um, metadata organization more standardized. Um, what bids will obviously rely on is, is another exciting effort that I've been lucky to be a part of, um, which is the nifty MRS data format, which um, was born out of frustration with the fact that every MRS vendor um, and scanner type has a different MRS raw data format because DICOM is really not great to store MRS data. Um, so it's an absolute nightmare if you want to do software development or data sharing. And um, Will Clark and Martin Wilson have spearheaded this, this effort to um, have a format specification that uses the nifty format and is therefore bits compatible, which will hopefully make life easier for everyone as there will be um, one format um, that will allow different softwares to talk to each other. It should be easier to um, make uh, data sets available um, without having to worry whether the other side can actually read the data. Will has created a Python software that pretty much takes any vendor proprietary format and converts it into Nifty MRS and the open source analysis software that Will and Martin and I develop are already able to handle it. So much, um, pretty much at 20 minutes where I wanted to be. Um, for this 
a quick overview or really just a snapshot of the state of reproducibility and variability and validation and data sharing in MRS world. And now I would like to, to switch over to my MATLAB screen and show you some of the tools that we um, develop and use in, in my group to do reproducible research. So I'll first show you some basic data processing steps using the um, FIDE toolbox, which was published by Jamie Neer of Sunnybrook in Toronto, um, who was previously at McGill for a very long time. And FIDE was really groundbreaking in the sense that it was a, the first publicly available open source toolbox to do MRS data processing with in a modular way. That was particularly new. And I'll then show you kind of like our entire data analysis workflow using the Osprey software that um, we've developed in our group that my postdoc Helga Zellner is now the lead developer of. And Osprey uses a lot of the FIDA call functions to do its basic processing. And we've built the entire ecosystem around it. There's all the steps of modern MRS data analysis for you. Um, Helga also submitted an abstract to MRI Together, where he presents how we use these ecosystems um, to, to prototype new processing and modeling methods, um, particularly using large scale data sets. So these um, presentations are done in MATLAB, which some may argue is not necessarily open source, which is probably true. But what I've done is I've uploaded a couple of executable um, live scripts to this repository um, for a workshop I recently taught in. And these are as close as you get to a Jupyter notebook using MATLAB. So I would encourage you to look at these. I want to highlight, um, obviously, with, with Will and Martin, there are a couple of great allies in, in this quest of making MRS more reproducible. Will has created um, an MRS package for the FSL library, which is also available on GitHub. And he also has some Jupyter notebooks there to demonstrate his workflows. If you're into R, I'd encourage you to take a look at Martin's um, Spanned Toolbox, which is another excellent open source package. I think all of our packages do roughly the same things, um, more or less, but in different environments and certainly with, with um, slightly different um, flavors. Sorry for interrupting. Uh, thanks a lot, Georg, already. Uh, maybe yes. this is a good time to ask some questions. I think in this uh, meeting, we can also just uh, speak up. And yes, you don't please. have to all write in the chat if that's more comfortable for you. Yeah, um, feel free. Feel free if, if there's anything I can I can help with. <laughs> uh, maybe I'll start with a question. Um, uh, in the simulation studies uh, with the yes. parameter recovery in the end, um, how confident can you be that you include all the confounding effects like face errors and so on? I mean, um, are you are you confident that you include the, in the simulations the relevant things going on in, at the scanner level? Yes, yes, and no. <laughs> I, I think I think we have a fairly good physical model of what's going on. So there are there are all kinds of artifacts, and I think that they they weren't necessarily all included in this study. Let me quickly scroll back. There was one particular artifact, you know, the, the influence of eddy currents, for example, um, that I believe was featured, for example, here in Spectrum M. Um, incomplete water suppression, poorly faced water peak. These are things that we typically do see. Um, when the study group fitting challenge was organized, I think it was five, six, seven years ago or something, um, I don't think they were thinking of, of all the artifacts to include. So I could think of a lot more of including frequency drift, of including spurious echoes, of including, uh, let's say, yeah, as you say, phase errors. Although with phase errors, at least, typically these fitting, fitting um, softwares are pretty good at ironing them out. Um, one thing that I want to highlight is definitely lipid contaminations, which um, is, is not really seen here. Lipids are not really well parametrizable so so they're typically a nuisance that is harder to get rid of and i would expect things to fall apart even quicker if you if you add lipid signals in there um macromolecular signals you know anything that's broad and really poorly characterized as soon as you throw that into the mix i would expect things to become a lot harder so to answer your question in one sentence i think we have a pretty good understanding and I don't think that it has been done in a large scale study where we really throw everything at a data set that can go wrong. <laughs> Does that make sense? Yeah, totally. Thanks a lot. Can I, can I just add to that? I mean, Absolutely. So we're, we're talking about um, human 
spectroscopy data so far. I mean, Correct. I'm very much interested in the preclinical side. And um, I mean, if you go to, to nine Tesla, 12 Tesla, then I'm, I mean, the, the lines all are not Lorentzian anymore. You get this inhomogeneous thing. Would this also be possible on this, the simulations for the preclinical data? I mean, I yeah. think there are a lot more. Yeah, artifacts. absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, as, as long as you have a rough physical model of, of what's going on in your scanner, and I would probably think it's it's eddy currents that are that are killing you at the higher fields at some point, um, or just line shape ir irregularities. You know, you can convolute your spectrum with an arbitrary kernel and and introduce line shape irregularities and see whether your algorithm can handle it. And that will totally then depend on the algorithm again, whether it has a term that accounts for line shape irregularities or not. So um, yeah, in, 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 in short term, as long as you have a good physical model of, of what you think introduces your algorithm, it would be no problem um, generating large scale data sets that suffer from this. Yeah, for sure. Okay. Further questions, please feel free to speak up and just ask. If there are none, yeah. we can proceed to the live demo. Yeah, just to wrap this up, Cornelius, because I think it's it's a really important question. Um, so one project that we're currently developing out of the um, out of the MRS Code and Data Sharing Committee is a large community organized um, synthetic data generator, which would be available through a web interface and in open source fashion. So we pretty much want to make this a tool that is available for everyone and is also modifiable you know by 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 everyone who who has a great idea so um i hope we can roll this out within a year or two where you can download i don't know a batch of a hundred thousand spectra that are you know and with with ground truth that suffer from all kinds of artifacts that you can switch on and off so um we're working on this and i'm i would be more than happy to um get your get your expertise and input on <laughs> things that can mess up spectra at at high field strength <laughs> Yeah, it would be great to have that too. I mean, really great. Cool. Yeah. Um, so perhaps to the audience, if you don't want to speak up, you can also type your question in the chat, but um, you can also just speak up. So cool. Great. So you should all see a um, MATLAB live script. Is that true? Wonderful. Cool. Um, I hope you won't blame me for um, having pre-run this thing because I recently, in the other workshop that I taught, I made the mistake of running this live while I was on Teams and it killed my computer completely. So um, this is the first of two um, of two live scripts that I want to go through, and this is the shorter one, um, briefly outlining kind of like a, the, the typical steps that are included when you analyze a, a, a raw MRS data set. And I'm doing that with the FIDE toolbox. As I said, FIDE um, is a lovely collection of modular functions for input and outputting, um, inputting and outputting raw data, and doing all kinds of like atomic operations on them that, that are typical to, um, to process MRS data. Phasing, doing alignment of, of individual transients, this kind of stuff. Um, and for example, what I've um, what I've written is is this input and output um, library IO load spec NII MRS for, um, is is a function that is already capable of loading this um, new nifty MRS file format. So if you ever encounter um, a data set like this, and I would I would um, anticipate that you will, um, this is the the kind of um, data that we can load. In this case, the example data that I've picked is just one of these short um, echo time press data and a water reference file. And what FIDE really excelled at and what was kind of new to it um, was the way that it, that it saves the data in a MATLAB structure almost in an object-oriented fashion, right? So um, it's, not, it's not formally object-oriented programming, but it, it's, it, it comes as close to doing so as as it um, as you can. It's a MATLAB structure with predefined fields, and all of these fields together really make up an entire object of MRS data. So in that sense, you know we have information here about the nucleus. Um, we have our time domain data with 2,048 points, 64 transients, and 32 coil elements. Um, we know the field strength. We know the echo time. Um, we know the repetition time, 
we have a frequency axis, we have a spectral width and a dwell time. So all the header information that you need at any given, given time to reconstruct the frequency domain spectrum um, is all preserved in this, in this constant um, data structure. It also can, um, includes the geometry of the voxels, so the positioning, the rotation, and all of that stuff, as well as a little bit of um, processing provenance information in the flags. And um, together with this big collection of functions, that really gives it its power that you can act with any function on almost any, um, any MRS data set in any state and um, you, can, you can build together almost in a plug and play fashion individual um, workflow. You can do rapid prototyping with it. And at any given point, you can do visualizations. So what we're doing here, for example, after we've loaded this extremely raw data and um, before we have done the, um, the coil combination, what we've done here, we've specified a frequency range over which we want to plot um, this object called metadata where we saved all of our data in. And we see here is pretty much just an arbitrary, I think it's coil element number one. So these are 64 um, transients from one coil element. Obviously, um, pre-coil combination, this is all going to be very noisy. And this is why we want to um, collapse this, this dimension of coils by performing complex coil combination procedures. And FIDE doesn't only have kind of the atomic operations, but um, it also has a few higher level operations, including um, opget coil combos, which uh, you can feed with pretty much any data. And in this case, I have decided to feed it with um, our water reference data because they obviously give us a lot more signal to noise to estimate the phases of the individual um, receiver coils, as well as the amplitudes. Um, so this function estimates the complex um, coefficients that we need in order to um, combine the coil elements and the op at receivers function take these, uh, takes these coefficients and um, returns a data set that then um, is collapsed um, in, in, the, in the coil dimension and only features um, the individual transients. And we see that reflected in the much higher signal to noise that we already have here, right? So these are the 64 um, transients or averages across this data set. Now, what typically happens, um, particularly on, on uh, clinical scanners, there are frequency instabilities and little transient to transient phase and frequency shifts. And um, if you just added or averaged um, up um, all of these transients, you would um, well, result in much broader line widths than you technically have to. And for these, there are nice little correction algorithms built into FIDE as well. Um, they just align these, um, these individual transients to one another by slightly shifting their frequencies and their phases. It's less obvious in this particular one, but um, well, if you look at, for example, the flank of this line here, um, the alignment is much improved. Well, not much improved because it's not a drastic case, but it reduced um, some, of the, some of the jitter in terms of the frequency um, that the different um, transients had with respect to each other. And well, now we're left kind of, as it says, with the most simple tasks. Now you can just average across the aligned transients and you will get your final spectrum, um, which then you can use one of the um, multiple um, export functions to, for example, save it in a format that allows you to um, fit it with the, OSP, uh, sorry, with the LC model algorithm or with the Tarquin algorithm or with the JMROI software. So, I mean, it's a really comprehensive, um, yeah, modular collection of, of tiny little functions that allow you to pretty much carry out any task um, that you want. So I would encourage you um, to try a couple of these little um, homework tasks that I've included in this, um, in this script. It's pretty amazing what you can do with it. And as I said earlier, um, one of the things that we did at some point was the realization that, well, we have all these little um, FIDE functions, we can actually build an entire um, complete suit um, around it that allows any user to, to feed any arbitrary MRS data into it and then automatically um, do all steps of modern MRS data analysis. So that is the Osprey software, which um, yeah, we, we kind of conceptualized as, as a one-stop shop um, that allows users to analyze their like large large scale batch data sets but in a reproducible way and um, we'll run through the, the the workflow in a tiny little bit 
it's all on GitHub, the entire code, the processing, the modeling, the quantification, um, it's, it's all publicly available. We do immediately talk to SPM12 to do some of the um, um, tissue um, segmentation tasks, which we need in order to carry out our relaxation correction correctly um, to arrive at water scaled concentrations. Um, as I say, this is all um, running on MATLAB as well. So basically, the Osprey workflow is, is divided up into, into modules which reflect the basic um, key steps of, of data analysis, pretty much from loading and, and processing, then handing over to, to the modeling, pulling in um, tissue information to, um, to do uh, relaxation corrections, and finally the quantification step where we convert all of these modeling parameters that we've just generated into um, units of concentration. And I think the, the, the most striking feature or, the, or the, the defining feature of Osprey is that you, unlike previous MRS analysis softwares, you have very little interactive influence um, during, the, during the analysis, what you want to do. So there's no interactive phasing, for example. There's no interactive tiny little frequency correction or, or an alignment or anything like that. You have exactly one point of contact with the analysis, and that is um, through the so-called job file. And um, we borrowed that concept pretty much from, from the SPM software, where you set up an entire analysis a priori. So you specify um, your input data, you specify options for the processing and the modeling and the quantification. And once you hit go, the thing kind of locks you out and you can only watch it do its stuff. And at the end of it, you can see what happened. And this has, I, th I, th I think might irritate people who are used in MRS particularly to, to kind of tinkering with, with their data sets a little bit, which in MRS due to its, I think high sensitivity to small experimental errors has been quite commonplace that, that um, there was a lot of individual adjustments in, in analyses, which is obviously a recipe for operator bias, a, rep, um, a recipe for introducing um, bad reproducibility and bad repeatability. So we bit the apple and said, this is precisely not what we want to allow. Um, instead, what we do, oops, and I hope I can still, still scroll. Yes, I can. Um, is, is to really define the, the analysis a priori by what's called a job file. And I'm going to scroll through an example. There's a lot of annotations here, but this is a job file that I use to carry out this analysis. And all that I do um, in this job file is specify a couple of options and then specify the files that I wanna be working on. So what I tell the Osprey software to do is pretty much, well, what type of data is this? Um, and that's largely because the um, vendor specific raw data aren't that great in really specifying what kind of acquisition has been done. I think I told you earlier on that in MRS world, there are a million different sequences and tiny little tailored tweaks. And it's impossible from just looking at the data to infer what kind of acquisition has been done. So spectral editing or diffusion weighted MRS or anything like that has been done. This is the um, this is where we specify this. If spectral editing has been done, um, we can specify, well, which was the molecule that we were applying our editing pulses to. Um, here's a little bit of a tweak. Was this in vivo data or in vitro data? If it's phantom data, we're making a couple um, assumptions about, well, line width, but also about temperature and use some um, frequency shifts. So all these tiny little things will influence the way that, that our data is, is loaded and processed. These are also a couple algorithms that are um, specified to do um, the individual transient alignment. You can specify whether you want to save data in any third party format to, to then carry on further operations in another software. We have different fitting algorithms implemented. We have a native one, but we also offer the option to directly feed um, the data into the LC model algorithm, which we've now incorporated by delivering the, um, the compiled binaries immediately in, um, in our repository. 
you can select the metabolites that you want to include in the modeling. Um, and a couple of, of um, further tiny, tiny changes that all influence the results. Um, the, the, stiff, uh, the stiffness of the baseline, for example, the modeling range. So these are all things that are um, settings that, that appear in pretty much any um, processing and modeling um, software. The heart of it, obviously, is, um, well, we need to tell Osprey at some point which data sets we want to, um, we want to treat. This is what happens in this section. So um, our default assumption is that files are provided in, um, in bits format. And um, well, we require spectroscopic data. We also optionally um, allow to provide um, reference files and water, um, water um, unsuppressed files and structural images, um, all of which are typically apply, um, acquired during an MRS experiment. And finally, what you specify is an output folder and typically in, in bits fashion, um, that all goes into a derivative folder. And that's really it. And the rest is pretty much carried out automatically um, by branching out workflows depending on the type of data and depending on what you want to do. And whoops, where are we? So once you have designed this job file, very akin to, to what SPM does, all that you do is run a series of MATLAB functions that all start with Osprey and then carry the name of the module. So in this sense, we are pointing to job file demo, which is this MATLAB text file that you just saw. And we are generating by this kind of the Osprey superstructure, which is very similar to, to, um, to the FIDE container that you just saw, but it's essentially a superstructure for a whole bunch um, of, of FIDE con data containers um, and objects that, um, that it carries. So as long as we, we've just initi um, initialized it, nothing much has happened. We've just um, written a bunch of um, file pointers and, and options into this. But as soon as we start loading the raw data with this command, um, which acts on, the, on this data container that we've just um, created, that's why I didn't uh, why I didn't do it live because loading um, Siemens raw data with all the coil um, with all the, the coil elements typically takes a long time. Um, but what Osprey does then is is to populate this structure with a whole bunch of um, of FIDE objects, as you can see here. So, for example, the raw data, the first element in the raw data. Um, is one of these familiar FIDE structures, which holds everything that we need to do in, able, in order to be able to um, reconstruct and further process a spectrum. Um, we have a whole bunch of um, visualization functions in there too, which I will show later on in the graphical user interface. As I say, um, the user interface only really allows you to, to visualize data and look at data, but not to manipulate it. So here in this thing I have, for example, um, it's a batch of two data sets and whoops, that was obviously not part of the plan. <laughs> it should not do this. Whoops. I should comment this out. Well, but there is a, um, there is a nice option to, to, um, to just display the individual transients of a particular, um, of a particular data set. And that is obviously before we have done the basic processing steps that you've seen in the previous one. So this is pre-alignment of the individual transients, pre-averaging, um, pre-eddy current correction. If you provide um, a water reference signal, um, water removal and some phasing and, and frequency referencing too. So this all happens within um, this particular module of Osprey. And again, you're essentially just dragging this this data container that you established at the beginning through this bunch of functions and receive different, um, different output plots and different, um, different steps of the analysis stage. So in this, um, this is a nice diagnostic sheet, which um, will give you feedback on the um, success of this alignment procedure of the individual transients. So in this case, we have pretty high quality data 
there was no frequency drift or anything else that would otherwise um, precipitate in, in kind of like a diagonal here where the frequency of the creatine signal would change over time of your acquisition. None of that happened here. Um, so the final um, aligned and average data is then um, shown to you in the bottom right. This is the data that will then subsequently be um, passed on to the modeling stage um, of your analysis. And as I say, for the modeling part, um, the Osprey FIT um, module essentially offers you, depending on what you entered into the job file in the beginning, to use the internal fitting algorithm or to outsource it to, um, to the LC model algorithm. Um, feeds you back a little bit of information about that. This is typically what the, what the results will look like. So we will show the data. You will see the FIT overlaid in yellow. You will see the baseline estimation and the individual um, contributions from each of the metabolites in your basis function, and you will see the fit residual um, superimposed on top of it, right? And from there, if you don't provide any additional information, let's say about um, if you don't provide um, water reference data, or if you don't provide um, structural images, for example, you will typically just go from there and calculate the individual metabolites relative to the total creatine signal, for example, um, here at 3 ppm, which is quite common way of reporting results. Um, if you want to scale it relative to a non-suppressed water signal, you will have to pull in information, um, as I said earlier, from um, structural imaging. And these two modules, the Osprey CoREC and the Osprey SEG, um, they directly pull in the SPM12 functions to create a binary mask of where your voxel is, um, overlays that correctly um, on the structural image, and then extracts the relative tissue volume fractions um, from gray matter, white matter, and CSF, provides you with um, little cartoons of, um, of where the voxel is and the individual voxel, voxel fractions from gray matter, white matter, and CSF. And it uses these tissue fractions to then um, perform um, relaxation corrections and pull in um, the correct water contents or from literature values that you can um, that you can individually specify um, in a lookup table. And Osprey Quantify pulls all of that together. And once you have performed all of these stages, you can call the Osprey GUI if you want to have it all in one place. And I'll just quickly show you what that looks like. So here you can, well, switch between the water reference um, and the metabolite data. Here on the left-hand side, oops, you have a whole, um, a whole list that you can skip through. Um, and there is no upper limit really other than your computer memory and for how many data sets you can process. We have processed, I think, close to, close to 500 with these without much of a problem. Um, and through all the other taps, you can just switch um, as I said, without the option of, of manipulating anything, but um, you can very rapidly do visual QA and get an idea of the quality of the data itself, but also of the processing and of the fitting um, of the co-registration and finally of the quantification. And so these are the quantitative out, um, outcome measures, total creatine ratios, but also from various water scaled um, metrics. They will also be output in a CSV file um, in the output folder that you specified in the job file. And from there, you can take it and, um, well, do your statistical analysis on it. So it really takes, takes the raw data that you got off from, from the scanner. And once you've punched it through all these seven functions, um, gives you full, full and complete quantitative estimates of your, um, of your metabolites. Cool. Um, I think we're at 48 minutes. I should probably make room for a couple of questions at this point. Thanks a lot, Georg. That's really a fantastic demo. It was great to see. We have a question from uh, Sanam. Uh, I think that's going back to the first part of your session as well. Um, so he, he or she is asking about uh, acquisition. Um, how is the reliability or reproducibility of MRS for circadian, circadian rhythm studies in preclinical contexts? Do you have any experience oh. on that? I, well, I'm, I'm less familiar with, with uh, preclinical. Now, um, 
when you talk about circadian, there are a couple studies. There's not a great deal of understanding in, in humans um, because it hasn't been extensively looked at. There are small end studies that point to diurnal stability so that you can do it and you get, you get decent reproducibility, I would say, on the order of 5 to 10%. But it depends strongly on the type of metabolite that you look at. So the stronger signals tend to, you know, obviously have, have better stability than really tiny ones um, that are harder to model and harder to detect. So there you probably would, would expect, I don't know, coefficients of variation of maybe 20%. Circadian, so within a day, I'm sure somebody has done it. I'm not sure somebody has done it with a sample size that I would trust. I think there's a lot of work done, as I say, on sample sizes between 12 and 20, which I tend to view very skeptically. Um, there are studies that, for example, were looking at GABA across the menstrual cycle. And these findings, I think the studies are from 2002, 2003 or three, something like that, have become somewhat seminal. Nobody has ever really bothered reproducing them. That's, that's another thing. If there are findings, few of them have been reproduced. So um, I, th I think a lot of these questions are still, are still out in the open. And, and partly, I believe they're out in the open because we can't always tell how much of our variability that we have is actually due to physiological variation and how much is due to differences in the data quality how much is due to the impact of different data quality on the modeling. So these are all overlapping and really, really hard to disentangle. So um, that's why I believe that we need to push for greater understanding of our, of our modeling process. And we need to generally push for, for larger, larger sample sizes. I think that's a major, major um, point of, of criticism that, that MRS has given an open flank to is a lot of the studies are not adequately powered to, to find small changes, if there are small changes. Sorry, super long-winded answer, and I ended up backing my own, <laughs> my own stuff from earlier with it. But I hope that answers your question, even if it's a little bit of a disappointing answer. I, I also have a question. Um, so do you do any phasing? I mean, I didn't see in the, the, pro, the process how, how, where, where the phasing is done. And I mean, phase correction is usually the one thing that requires user interaction because I mean, if you have first order phase effects and large offsets, then that's difficult. Yeah. Is it done yeah. automatically? Um, so yes, for, for the zero, so, so typically for, um, and this might be my lack of experience with preclinical data. In clinical data, my experience is there's relatively little um, first order first order phase effects typically, at least on the clinical um, field strength that we that we see, 1.5 and 3 and 7 Tesla. It's I've I've rarely seen a data set that came in with an with an uncorrectable first order phase error. Um, what we do to correct for zero order is pretty much we do a basic, um, simple, quick fit of just the strongest metabolites, and that typically pulls it straight. So, so there the phase is a modeling parameter, and that that is um, sufficient to pull to pull the spectrum spectrum pretty pretty correct into the correct phase. And then what happens during the full modeling step, all modeling um, algorithms have zero and first order terms in them as well. So your phase correction um, typically happens during the linear combination algorithm. That's where, where, the, final, where the final tweaks happen, and the final differences between your, between your model and your data are pulled straight by, by explicit phasing terms during the modeling. You just need to get it approximately right during the pre-processing. Yeah, okay, thank you. Uh, do you also have, um, so in the, the version you showed, you have to specify which metabolites to include. I think there's also algorithms to do statistical decisions, uh, <laughs> which are significant, which are not. Uh, do you include that? Um, we, we, don't have, we don't have anything like that. And I have, I, 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 will, I will admit, I, I'm, 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 not a, I'm not aware, like immediately from the top of my head of, of any like published and a well validated algorithm that, that does that like i think i'm not what, an expert I'm, i just heard that people do research on this oh yeah and certainly there are i think what but but 
I haven't seen anything convincing on this, partly, as I say, because the validation problem is always there. Um, I think what, what ultimately will have to go in there is kind of, um, you, you kind of have to, to, to do like model selection. So to, to have some kind of um, trade off between model complexity, like the information yep. criterions, for example, yep. like the AICs, like what kind of, do, does, does including this additional metabolite basis function, um, is, is that justified by reducing my residual enough? Like that is essentially yeah. what, what you what you need, and I don't think that anybody has has solved this or addressed this sufficiently. Um, I've not seen it. I would I would like we have thought about running these kinds of things and 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 getting our hands dirty with it, and I think it's it's something that we should be done. But to answer your question with a simple yes or no, no, we don't no. have that because I don't think anybody has done it <laughs> okay thanks a lot further questions please uh, feel free to unmute and and ask yourself i think we're only a couple of people left here so I mean, yeah. we're, i think we filled the time very well and, um... and it was a fantastic presentation i think this is really a great tool both osprey and the um, live script you you showed us. I think that's uh, great for any newbie in spectroscopy or even experienced researchers. Thank you. I think that was that was really just just to to wrap it up and to yeah to to say that that was really one of the motivations is is to give newcomers a starting point because that was just something that myself and others on the committee like we thought back in horror to our days where we are when we were doing our PhDs and nobody could even give us a starting point, like even where to begin, because nothing exists. You could you could Google for days and not find a decent a decent analysis script to begin with. And and I think that is changing with you know with Osprey, with um, with FSLMRS and with with Spand, you know, what what Martin and Will are doing. And I th I think it is becoming more accessible to not just more reproducible, but we're really trying to to make an effort to make it more accessible to and. Hopefully, get a couple of, of uh, yeah motivated people to help us out. <laughs> it's Maybe. a small it's a small field. I think that's another another problem. Yeah. Maybe one last question from uh, my personal uh, interest: um, How well do you think will Osprey work with X nucleus data? Um, do you see see limitations or? Uh, and I'm working with Fluin MRI. We have very low SNR. Do you see in in principle it should cope with that? Yeah, I think so too. I mean, the the thing is that a lot of the routines that we have right now are, are very tailored to um, to proton, but the the whole idea of of making Osprey very modular was that you can branch out the workflow at any given point within each module, right? So we can do a mm. process module, and we can say, well, look, if this is fluorine or the carbon thirteen data, do a couple things differently, like don't look for an NAA peak to do the phasing but look for a different reference peak, right? And yeah. like, if you have a workflow, you know, we can, we can put that into, into, um, into an if statement and, and work with it. And then, you know, the modeling, you either, we either hand off to LC model or we do it ourselves. It's all, it's all possible. At the moment, it's very heavily tailored towards Proton because we've been doing that, but it's certainly, the, the basis is there to branch it out arbitrarily and, yeah, especially I, with the open source code you have now. Yeah, I've I've just managed to to just a couple a couple of weeks ago I've I've um, helped a friend out just doing some lipid spectra which are still proton but they they are weird enough that some <laughs> of the stuff falls over and um, yeah that that worked well right it's just it's it's just about branching out and and yes it's totally doable. Cool. Thanks a lot. Okay. So Georg, thank you very much. Uh, it was really an excellent session and 